Assalamu alaikum jamee'an and thank you so much for sparing your valuable time to attend this talk and I really hope that it will be of an added value to you. So as you can see on the screen, our topic today is going to be about the online informal language learning, keeping up with today's learners. So let me start with a short story from my own classroom before presenting the outline of this talk. So I had a student who was a very fluent English speaker. She missed the placement test, so she started from, uh, from level one, but she was above the level of her class with regard to her English proficiency. Uh, I was always under the impression that she had attended private schools, maybe, or intensive, um, like where intensive or immersive English was the norm. So once I was giving the students like a task in which they had to talk about their schools, I think, and this student mentioned that she studied in a public school. So I asked her uh, whether she lived abroad or if her family spoke English at home. And she stated that both her parents are monolingual speaker and don't know any English. And then she learned English by herself in her own time. She said that she watched movies, listened to music in English, and naturally she improved her language proficiency. Now, I'm sure that this is not a unique story, and I bet that you have come across similar stories, but this is like a strong indication of how online informal learning is changing our learners today. Not all of them, of course, but the majority of them. And nowadays, actually, we're teaching the Generation Z or that digital generation. So they have been using like smartphones since forever or since a very early age, which will definitely have a strong impact on how they view traditional classrooms. In today's talk, I'm going to talk about online informal language learning, the differences between formal and informal learning, and then what does our research tell us about informal language learning, and then how to bridge the gap between formal and informal learning, the last part is connected to the theme of this symposium where I'm going to talk about useful educational technologies to teach the productive skills of speaking and writing. Let's start with a short definition of uh, the online informal language learning. So what do we mean by online informal language learning or OWL, which is considered a novel field in TESOL or more specifically call? By call, I mean the computer assisted language learning. So I should add here that when I say OWL, then I mean online informal language learning. So OWL basically means learning without having the intention to learn. So learning is only a byproduct of engaging in interesting activities, be it like watching films, listening to music in English and stuff like that. So the central focus of this field is whether the Relatively recent and frequent use of English on the internet in everyday life can lead to improvements in the level of English language proficiency. Now, let's move to the differences between formal learning, non-formal learning, and informal learning. So, formal learning was defined as a type of learning provided by education institution. This learning is structured and leads to certification. So formal learning is exactly what we have here at the university. Non-formal learning was defined as a type of learning that is not provided by education institutions and does not lead to certification. However, this learning is very structured and organized. It is learning something intentionally, like when a learner like uh, watches a YouTube video to get more clarification of a certain grammar rule, for example. Then we have the last one, which is um, um, the most interesting one, actually, is the informal learning, okay, which is the type of learning associated with daily life activities to entertain oneself or to communicate with family and friends. It is unstructured and it could be intentional, but most of the time it is unintentional. And again, I'm sure that you have come across uh, relatively fluent learners who develop their skills from the internet or from incidental learning, be it watching movies, listening to music in English or so forth. So online informal language learning is basically a subfield of informal learning. So informal, uh, yeah, informal language learning has always been understood as a complex field. 
Why? Because you're trying to observe informal language learning, which is a private experience. And usually learners who are carrying out these online activities are not really like seeking to learn English. And their learning is mostly incidental or just a byproduct of engaging in online informal language learning activities. So they don't like play games in English because they want to learn English. No, but they feel that English will help them to play online games. So it is mostly incidental. So it's very challenging to track this kind of learning. Now, let's just talk about incidental and intentional learning. So incidental learning is the process of learning something without the intention of doing so. It is also learning one thing while intending to learn another or to do another thing. In terms of uh, lang language acquisition, incidental learning is said to be an effective way of learning vocabulary from context because it promotes deeper mental processing and better retention. So it is considered one of the best type for uh, learning vocabulary because you are learning from exposure or from the context. Now, let's just go to the intentional vocabulary learning based on synonyms or substitution. It is not so effective because learners are directed to root learning. So everything that learners learn in the classroom will just go to the short term memory. And after that, it will disappear. Uh, if you don't involve or if you don't use certain strategies and techniques uh, that involve certain like cognitive process, which I'll, uh, I'll talk about later. Uh, let's talk about uh, the literature a little bit. And I promise you that I'm not going to talk about the literature a lot. And this is a promise. And the talk will be focused on real and practical pedagogical aspects that you can apply in your own classroom. But first, let's like situate OWL with the other research paradigms. So essentially, OWL is a research area that overlaps with COL. By COL, I mean computer-assisted language learning, and also with uh, incidental learning or incidental acquisition, and also with autonomy. Because like a uh, key characteristic of users of OWL is to have strong autonomy or agency to engage with uh, English learning activities outside the school. So OWL is like complicated is a complicated actually field because it is hard to track and uh, like it essentially overlaps with many research areas. So it's very hard to understand from where to start. So however, like complexity does not mean that it is like impossible to study learners OWL activities. And in the coming slide, I'll present some interesting findings related to OWL and language acquisition. And I'll later discuss how can we bridge the gap between formal and informal learning. So what does the literature tell us about OWL in general and how can we apply that to classroom practice? Several studies suggest like a positive relation between learners informal online activities and their language proficiency level. The more they engage with OWL, the higher their proficiency level. So learners who reported that they listen to music or to songs, watch movies in English, achieved higher in their English courses. Many studies found like a strong link and connection between uh, vocabulary acquisition and informal online learning and also willingness to communicate. This is very important. Uh, by willingness to communicate, I mean uh, learners' desire to participate and actively practice their language. Another very interesting finding is that most students reported that they are using English freely and <clears throat> are not worried about making any mistakes when online. As one of the Turkish participants in Thorn and Fisher study mentioned that uh, having people from many countries wipes away the fear of looking, looking, uh, looking so silly when trying to pronounce correctly. This is hugely interesting because they're not only practicing the language, but they are also raising the level of their openness toward the word, or what we call it international posture. And they are boosting their self-confidence when, uh, when, yeah, when online, actually. 
This is also very interesting. There was no relationship between informal language learning and socioeconomic background variables, which is also interesting. So learners from various economic classes are actively engaging in informal language learning. Uh, so I believe that we have, alhamdulillah, good technological infrastructure here in Saudi Arabia, and almost all of our learners have access to the internet or to smartphones. So having access to OWL is not an issue here. So it's not an issue here within our context, but the question is, do they really use it? I'm going to discuss this later. Uh, Schwartz mentioned that learners engaged in many OWL activities and she introduced a new concept called niche activities. So she talks about niche activities and how her learners like to write rap songs in English, which had a huge impact on their fluency. So this kind of activity is considered niche or original. This was actually a very, uh, like a very small scale study because it is very hard to measure uh, informal learning on a large scale, which is something I agree with. Let's just go to online games. Uh, according to Sunquist, okay, uh, gaming can be a game changer for English language learning. Question is, will gaming be a game changer for English teaching? I guess not yet, but let's see the findings of online gaming and informal language learning. Um, actually, I'm pretty confident that in the coming years and that within this context, uh, especially that the number of online gamers would definitely increase. You might have noticed yourself that most teenagers nowadays are spending their free time online and most of them are very passionate about certain kinds of online games. So this should actually be a rich area for research in the future. Sankus found like a positive relation between gaming and vocabulary learning. So frequent, uh, sorry, frequent gamers were found to outperform the non-frequent gamers in their, yes, in their proficiency level. So Sankra suggested that it is a myth to say that gamers only know specialized gaming vocab. Of course, they know these words, but they know more than that. She also noticed like advanced vocabulary used in their essays. So she mentioned that gaming might encourage their oral interaction and also their writing as well. So now, ladies, what about our students or our learners? According to my study, which is actually part of my PhD study. So I finished my PhD like a year ago, and these are some of the findings. So learners within this context, uh, and here I'm talking about only female students, OK? Uh, so. So learners were found to be moderate users, but the data was collected like three years ago. So I would assume that the use of OWL has increased now. 90% of the sample mentioned that they watch movies in English and listen to music in English. And this was strongly related to their motivation toward uh, learning English in general. And as you can see, the order of popularity here music on top, followed by movies, and then uh, the online video games. To summarize, actually, or in, in, a, like in, in a nutshell, learners from all over the world, including here in Saudi Arabia, are engaging in different online informal language learning activities. And we actually need to bridge the gap or between formal and informal learning. And now I'm going to talk about how to keep up with with like today's learners, and this is actually the essence of today's talk. Okay, so since the focus of this uh, symposium is on enhancing language learners' communicative skills, so my talk is going to focus on productive skills, speaking or writing, and of course, vocabulary learning, which is an essential part of the two skills. And when we say speaking, then definitely we need words or vocabulary to be able to communicate. And here, uh, let me share this quote for David Walkins, which is one of my favorite. Without grammar, little can be conveyed, but without vocabulary, nothing actually can be conveyed. So like without a good working knowledge of words and their meanings, both written and verbal communication will actually be like uh, muddied or very poorly understood. And this actually explains the structure of the English text box that we are using nowadays. 
where the focus actually is um, on communicative approaches based on the idea that um, based on the idea actually that learning a language successfully comes uh, through having to communicate real meaning and we no longer focus on teaching grammatical rules I think how can you teach vocabulary in this digital world to bridge the gap between what learners do in their free time and what do we offer in our English classrooms? First, let's talk about like vocabulary learning strategies in general. So it has been claimed like that a learner can learn 30 to... Um... Okay, so... Uh, so it has been claimed that a learner can learn 30 to 50 words a day, but the actual number of words a learner can learn in the class is actually zero. This is because the mind does not retain anything you learn as a long-term or as part of a long-term memory. So learners might need to review a word again and again many times before a word becomes acquired. So students actually might not remember any of the words you teach them in the class if these words are not really associated with actual practice. And that's why we are offering actually here in the ELI like intensive English courses, because we want to give learners like enough time to practice. So how can you truly like invest your class time with the aid of uh, digital technologies? Uh, so. Uh, the previous speakers or my colleagues have um, thankfully like shared amazing tips and strategies to teach these uh, communicative skills, but my talk will focus on how to use um, technology to achieve this. Okay, so first of all, it's really useful to introduce some of the digital dictionaries okay that students can use in your class as research shows that learners who use a dictionary learn more vocabulary than those who just like <clears throat> rely on guessing from context and that learners who use like an english to english dictionary actually remember vocabulary better than those using like a bilingual dictionary or like english arabic okay so it's very important to orient your students about this, for example, in your, in your first class with them. You can show them some useful electronic dictionaries, whether apps or websites. Most online dictionaries also have like app versions to be uh, installed on mobile devices. And you need to encourage them to actively use them during your class time. For example, I always show my students in my first class with them the Cambridge app or website, and uh, I orient them in how to use it. And whenever they encounter like a new word, I, yes, I ask them to refer back to that dictionary. So this can become a habit. Another amazing website is this one, Youglish. So you can ask them to listen to the pronunciation in their own time outside your classroom, maybe using Youglish. So in Yiglish, they can listen to the pronunciation of the word in actual context. So Yiglish is basically a collection of YouTube videos. So whenever you insert a word, you will get a video with the pronunciation of the word in a real context. So it's an amazing website and it does not require like any preparation from your site. After introducing the word and the pronunciation of the word, you can practice the new words with them using uh, various apps like uh, Kahoot. So systematic use of Kahoot and the uh, like um, and these types of tools would be excellent. And I think the LI has included Kahoot as a recommended app in their basic guides. So it's a great app, but not really suitable for university level, in my personal opinion. But you can uh, still like uh, use it every now and then to engage your students. So it's pretty easy and intuitive to use. But if you need like to watch a very quick tutorial, then maybe you just need to scan the barcode down there and then watch it in your own time. It's a short tutorial into how to use uh, Kahoot for vocabulary learning. Yes, for sure, yeah. I can share the PowerPoint at the end. Then again, as I said, Kahoot is great, but it's actually not like really suitable for university students, in my personal opinion, actually. So it's designed like for kids. So a great alternative to Kahoot, which I think is more suitable for adult learners, is Quizlet. So I usually use this one with my students. So Quizlet um, 
has pronunciation features. So if you're interested, you can scan the barcode and watch the tutorial in your own time. Then you can start to use it in your classroom if you wish to do so, of course. Then a final thing, which is extremely important, is that you need to ask your students to put the new words in meaningful sentences. As according to the literature, mastering a new word involves forming meaningful sentences. You can do this by creating like a Google collaborative doc and ask the students to put the new words in a meaningful sentence. Uh, personally, I use this form with my students. So feel free to borrow the form by scanning the barcode if you wish. So you can add it to your drive, make a copy or whatever works best for you, or you can design your own. It's very important to address all these stages for vocabulary learning from meeting new items in context, accessing the meaning via lexical tools like dictionaries, mapping the words meaning and form using like tables in Google Docs to receptive or productive use of the item. So following these practices, which are based on the literature, can be beneficial in engaging your students in the process of acquiring or learning vocabularies. If you just like introduce a new word and then move on, the word will just stay for a short term in their short term memory, and then it will disappear. So it's extremely important that you involve their working memories by using the strategies that I've um, previously mentioned. Uh, let's talk about speaking. So to achieve speaking proficiency, we need the important aspects to assist that, which are accuracy, complexity, and fluency. Uh, Carmen's considered speaking accuracy to be part of what he calls the basic linguistic proficiency that all native speakers have acquired, but complexity and to some extent fluency belongs to the extended linguistic proficiency that is attained only by advanced study of the language. So speaking proficiency also depends on the type of the task that the L2 student is asked to carry out. So it's very important that the tasks are designed in a pedagogical way, considering all of these aspects presented in this slide. Now, um, for us here as uh, like instructors in the ELI, um, I don't know if we have any attendees who are not from the ELI, but we are not actually involved in the designing process of the tasks. But it's extremely important for you as a teacher to understand what does speaking proficiency involve to help your learners. Uh, because at the end, like um, language is communication and speaking is an important skill and you need to be aware of the theories behind it to be able to like facilitate it in an effective way. So the way the tasks are designed here in the textbook that we use here in the LI is the task-based approach, which includes like an analytic post uh, phase that carefully uh, studies the linguistic structures needed to accomplish the assigned tasks. Skin suggests that the best tasks are those that are carefully structured with both a pre-planning and a post-task phase are organized around familiar information, require like analysis or justification, and are interactive or collaborative in nature. So to benefit from the great technology that we have, we can ask students to use the read aloud in Google Doc or the voice typing. This is something that they don't really need to use in the classroom, but you can introduce them to this and ask them to use it in their own time. For example, for me, what I usually do is I ask them to, to use the Google Doc to practice before the speaking project where they can read aloud and the computer should write what they are saying. And the algorithm of Google Doc works with many accents and they tell them that if the computer could not understand you, then your pronunciation is maybe incomprehensible. And they tell my students that we don't really need to have like um, native like pronunciation and what really matters is just um, achieving a clear and comprehensible pronunciation. So the dictation is also available in Microsoft Word, but it's not very accurate. So I tell my students not to use the one in Microsoft because it is so sensitive to different accent and can be very frustrating. But the one in Google Doc is really advanced and the more you use it, the more it will get used to your accent. And then 
they can use it like um, on their smartphone by downloading the Google Driver app. So I'm sure that you have um, heard about it and you know how to use it. But in case not, then please scan the barcode for a short YouTube video. It is only like a two minutes video and it's pretty easy to use. You can access it from your phone or browser, but just make sure that you use Google Chrome and then you can access it from there. Let's just move to enhancing the, enhancing the writing skill in this digital age. With the writing, I'm not going to suggest something complicated and I'll be realistic here. As you know, like uh, due to the demanding nature of the courses offered here by the ALI, we cannot like introduce or use any external websites, but I'm just going to suggest some collaborative tools that facilitate the teaching of the writing as it's important to use collaborative tools. And I'm sure that many of you are already doing so. And uh, like a very basic um, collaborative tool is Google Doc, where you can ask students to share their writing using Google Docs, and then they can discuss it uh, together or so. And you can comment on it. And this is an actual example from my own classroom. You can also introduce them to the read and write in Google Chrome which is free for educators. If you register as an educator, you'll get the text speech for free. So students can write their writing and the app will read it aloud for us in the class. And you can choose the accent that you want and the voice that you prefer, male or female, and it can read aloud any text. So it's very interesting to use this one during the writing, okay? So I usually ask them to write and then the app will read for us. By this, actually, you are like acting as a modern facilitator and students might be more engaged when you implement such technologies. OK, so finally, so it's very important to bridge the gap between formal and informal learning in order to avoid forming like a disjuncture between what teachers offer in the classroom and how learners operate in their daily lives. As a teacher, how can you keep up with new technologies? Number one, I'm just going to say that. Education is a never ending process. It does not like stop after earning a degree. Even if you earn like a PhD, you have to keep learning. And uh, so you need to keep learning about recent technologies by reading blogs or watching the educational YouTube channels to positively impact students' learning experiences. So I understand that like using technology can be intimidating because like it keeps changing so rapidly. So continue training in the use of call applications to promote L2 teaching should be part of your plan. So I'll conclude by saying technology will never replace great teachers. So don't worry about this, but in the hands of great teachers, it is transformational. So try to implement the technology in a meaningful way and always keep yourself up to date. These are the references. Thank you so much for listening and thank you.